Now it's time for uh, today's perspective on the programme and it's a story of one of uh, the biggest robberies of all time, the search for a mystery genius who may not even exist and the tale of a mastermind incarcerated by the ruthless reputation of the Japanese judicial system. I'm talking of the uh, latest book by the renowned Tokyo-based American journalist Jake Adelstein who has lived in Tokyo now, uh, in fact, for 30 years. His latest book, Pay the Devil in Bitcoin. This is the French version, Je Vendu du Monde Am on Bitcoin. Thanks very much for coming in oh, and thank talking you. to us um, today on the programme. I mean, it sounds very exciting, I hope, anyway, this introduction. And yet, this is a book about Bitcoin. And I have to be honest, when somebody says Bitcoin to me, it doesn't sort of sound particularly sexy. But And yet, who knew Bitcoin could be so exciting? Well, thank you very much. I mean, Bitcoin, you know, started as this um, idealistic cryptocurrency that would be to the financial system what the internet was to information. But it quickly turned into basically a currency for criminals and malcontents. And uh, this book is a lot, uh, a great deal of this book is discussing, you know, the discovery of Bitcoin as something that you could use to buy drugs on the internet anonymously. Mm. And how over time um, people were able to track that anonymous transactions. And also about Mark Karpolis, who would be sort of the gone before gone. Yeah, Mark Hopolis is the, uh, he's the, the, the mastermind, if you like, behind the Bitcoin exchange uh, Mount Gox, isn't he? And he, the book starts as he's accused by the Japanese authorities of stealing 850,000 of his own company's Bitcoins. Yes, and, uh, and as it turns out, well, I'll be giving away the, the part of the book, uh, he is clearly not guilty of the crime that he was arrested for. But that doesn't matter, just like Gon, the Japanese, once the Japanese authorities decide that you're guilty, they arrest you. They rearrest you, and they rearrest you, um, and then they incarcerate you. I believe that he was in jail for eight months before finally getting bail, um, and he his trial is coming up on March fifteenth, uh, mm. and none of the charges relate to the stolen bitcoins. So imagine an entire investigation based on these stolen bitcoins, and the Japanese police in the court have said, "We actually don't know who stole the bitcoins, and we don't care because we're going to convict him on other charges." And that's the Japanese justice system. At the beginning of the book, you're not certain of his, his guilt or not, are you? Oh, oh, at the beginning of the book, I wasn't. You know, Karpos is a very interesting person. He's a little asperger -y. I like him. But uh, he always is sort of this Cheshire cat smile on his face. And, Bit of a geeky type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and he's like, um, it'll be fine. Should be fine. Should be fine. That's his mantra. And uh, at the beginning, you know, you, you, you think the obvious answer would be the answer. The Bitcoins dis disappear and he's running everything. It must be him. But uh, halfway through, when um, I was a police reporter for 12 years, uh, working for a Japanese newspaper, and so I have a lot of police contacts. And when I'm hearing from the police themselves that half of the criminal, um, there are two different teams working on this case, the IT cops and the white collar cops. And when the IT cops are saying, we don't think this guy is guilty, or we're not sure he's guilty, but the white collar cops are definitely sure that he's guilty, and they figure they're just going to arrest him and get him to confess. And, and when you hear that, you're going, well, if, if even the police aren't sure, maybe I shouldn't be sure either. And as you say, the book also goes into the kind of shady area of, of, of Bitcoin and, and of the internet as well. We hear about Silk Road, for example. Well, sure, because, because Mt. Gox was the center of Bitcoin trading, right? And Mt. Gox started as a platform to trade Magic the Gathering playing cards, converted into a Bitcoin platform. Everything went through Mt. Gox. So when Silk Road was first written up in Gawker on June 1st, 2011, as the underground marketplace where you can buy any drug imaginable, um, and they listed Mt. Gox as the place to buy your Bitcoin, suddenly the price of Bitcoin went up mm -hmm. greatly. Um, and during the Silk Road investigation, uh, two federal agents, one from the Secret Service and one from the Drug Enforcement Agency, started stealing Bitcoins from Ross Ulbrich and Silk, Silk Road. One of them tried to get Mt. Gox, or Mark Karpolis, to be his business partner. That was to be Karl Mark Force the fourth. And when Karpolis said no or expressed no interest, he used his powers as a special agent to freeze five million dollars of Mt. Gox's assets. Um, and at one point, uh, the Ross Ulbrich who runs Silk Road put a contract out on Mark's life because he was cooperating with the police. And the police who were working the case told the drug lord running Silk Road that. Karpolis is working with us. So this guy is very unlucky and actually yeah. well-intentioned. Another bit of the book I love is, is this uh, plot, if you like, to try and discover who actually invented Bitcoin. This is the mysterious uh, Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto. Nakamoto. Does he even exist? 
I, I believe that Satoshi Nakamoto definitely exists. He was prolific in his writing. I've read everything that the man has written. Uh, and he, he does not have a sense of humor. He is very likely British. Um, the only thing that I've ever seen him cracking a joke is when they were asking him in the early days, what is Bitcoin for? What can we use it for? He said, um, maybe for porn. You know, maybe husbands could buy porn over the internet and their wives wouldn't know, and then the porn guys wouldn't have their credit cards. And I thought, okay, it, uh, maybe he's cracking a joke. But uh, he definitely exists. It's definitely one person. It's consistent all the way through. Um, but I don't know who. But I have no idea. Carpolis mm. seems to know. Okay. But that's you the won't next book. <laughs> yeah, that would be the next book. That's the next book. Let's talk about yourself as well a little bit, because uh, as I said, you live in Japan, you work as a journalist there. You also spent covering very much the dark side of Japan, extortion, murder, and of course the uh, Yakuza, the Japanese mafia, resulted in death threats against you uh, and your family as well. Oh yes, that was an, an unpleasant time. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the gangster that I really dislike, Godo Tadamasa, is still alive. In Cambodia he has his new fiefdom, he's a guest of the state. The United States put him on a, uh, a blacklist so he can't come into the, into the US. Japan is happy to have him come back in because he's politically connected. And the Yakuza, are they still something that you're, you're fascinated by? I, you know, I am fascinated by them, but they are dying out. Years of good legislation and law enforcement has reduced the numbers from 80,000 to 10,000. Um, the second book I've, I've written, Leonard Daenerys, The Yakuza, The Last of the Yakuza, um, chronicles why they are disappearing, and I will not be sorry to see them go. I, I will be sorry because I have all these Yakuza magazines and videos, and I, I guess I'm going to have to set up a museum in Paris. <laughs> You're going to become an authority on them. <laughs> yes, yes, but, but, but more and more it's like being a historical authority because their power is waning. And just briefly, finally, what next? Because, I mean, obviously you've, you've had these several areas that you've really delved into. I mean, is it, is it more of the same, trying to find out more? Um, I, you know, I'm increasingly interested in Japanese politics. That's not a very sexy topic, so I have no idea what to write next. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find something. <laughs> Jay, thanks very much. Jake uh, Adelstein joining us here on the program today for today's perspective. Thanks for coming in and talking to us on the program. Thank you. Let's update you on the main stories. And as Jake was just uh, referring to, that story uh, about Carlos Ghosn in the last hour, prosecutors in Tokyo appealing the decision to approve the bail, which had been granted just a few hours ago to Carlos Ghosn. Now, bail uh, was set earlier to 1 billion yen for Ghosn, the ousted chairman of Nissan, who's fighting charges of financial misconduct. And a promise to cut taxes, reduce fees and streamline red tape. That from China's premier as he opened up the annual National People's Congress, warning that the country faces a tough struggle to prop up its economy.